Welcome to the D6 Family Ministry Podcast, a place where ideas, principles, and personalities come together to give you a ministry advantage that empowers the church and home. I don't know anything more important in our society or in the kingdom of God than to help the church help the family. Discipleship is not an event, it's a way of life. And one day it just hit me that discipleship at home was not about doing more. It was about inviting Christ into what we were already doing. The goal of family ministry is not families sitting on the couch, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. The ultimate goal is families that love God, love people and make disciples of all peoples. So that's why you're here. You're here to say one hour a week, as significant and as awesome as it is, we know that it's not enough and we want to be intentional with every hour. You're listening to the D6 Podcast. Here are your hosts, Marianne Howard, Ron Hunter, and Josh Wooten. Okay, Marianne, I want to talk about a very uh, interesting subject that I'd rather not talk about. Okay. You and I discussed this off the air, and this is where I want to go into my defense mechanism and be the one asking the question so I don't have to talk. Okay. But the, let's describe our teenage years for our listening audience. This, this is, <laughs> and I want to avoid this like everything in my being, you know? Um, how, would, how would other people say you were as a teenager? How would they describe your looks, your yeah. actions? What were your interests? Give us, give us the the, okay. the down and dirty here. Um, well, it was hard, um, and I'm with you. It's some sometimes I just kind of want to put that season out of my life and out of my mind and just pretend it didn't happen, but it did. And today's interview is, you know, Ryan is so passionate about Generation Now and leveraging influence and world change with this generation. And to be honest with you, I wish that I would have maximized my walk with Jesus and certain moments when I was a teenager, but I didn't, um, I will just tell you, and, and I don't want to draw this out like we have in the past, but I will tell you my last name was Moranus. And I am going to share that on the podcast. That was my last name on my birth certificate. And so for all of my youth pastor friends and children's ministry friends out there that have gone into junior high mindset with my last name, I want you to know that I went through years (laughs) of trauma because I was ruthlessly bullied with my last name. And because of that, I people pleasing was as a, as a girl, teenage girl, who's trying to find her place and identity. I people pleased my way through high school, which did not lead me down a path that was productive or helpful. Uh, I will tell you, I am redeemed by the blood of the lamb and there is no piece of my past that I let or shame that defines my story. Um, but I will tell you my teenage years were very difficult and I went my own way for a minute. (laughs) So that was part of my story. What about yours? Oh, my goodness. Um, mine was not necessarily of rebellion outwardly. Um, I was in a Christian home and was in church and in a Christian school. But I will quickly tell you, because you're in a Christian school does not mean it has higher values than uh, other places. It just I think it teaches you how to hide your uh, mm-hmm. rebellion. Wow. And you know, mm-hmm. so there were things that I got into that nobody really knew, not horrible. And I was generally a good kid, but my problem was I was an introvert mm-hmm. and then layer that with, there's no way I, I say this other than I was a zip plantation. I hate my senior photos. Mm-hmm. I was constantly dealing with treatment. And so, you know, that just breeds wonderful date opportunities mm-hmm. left and right, you know, so no, all, all of those layers, <laughs> you know, in there, like, you know, it, it was tough, you know, you, you already struggling with your self image. You're yeah. struggling with that. I, I was not super uh, athletic. I mean, I did well, I did okay, participated, but that was not my strength. And I never played a musical instrument. So, you know, as I heard Ryan in this interview, I actually thought through how I struggled with my own value system of, of my self value. That is, Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I, I kind of poured myself into goals and competitions that were non-athletic and non-musical. If I could excel and, and do something, then that overcame my appearance and my awkwardness. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and it kind of just shaped who I, who I am. And I think some of that pours over even into today. You know, mm-hmm. I'll second guess my own self mm-hmm. abilities or self appearance or any one of those number of items. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'll over mm-hmm. overcompensate by pouring myself into another task or another area. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm, I just would like to hit the delete button and and, no. and skip right past all those team no. years. No, that's this it. candor and transparency is what this podcast is about. So yeah, I'm thankful that you that you shared that. I, I want to also say. You know, we grew up in a time where the digital age was non-existent. And so yeah. I'm just trying to fathom what my life would have been like with yeah. this, basically this buffet is yes. how I want to call it. What I want to call it is this buffet of digital absorption. And that's one of the things he addresses early on in the interview. And um, I just, I can't fathom my life with with the digital age. I just, I look at my kids and go, you know, there's pieces of your world and you're growing up that I don't understand. Yes. Um, aren't you, aren't you glad that if, if we lived in the teenage years with the social media and somewhat of the permanent record, mm-hmm. it does, it creates a permanent record. It does. I'm so thankful. I just mentioned, I wanted to delete my teenage years on the flip <laughs> side. I'm so glad nobody can go back and see what I was thinking, how I would have said something Mm-hmm. The crassness that maybe would have come out right. of my mouth in mm-hmm. in ways that, as I look back, I was embarrassed over growing up in the deep south. Things that you know, I didn't think I was. I was a little more than what I'd like to admit. Um, mm-hmm. Thank goodness, I'm, I, as you said, been very much redeemed, very mm-hmm. much taken a whole different shift in in God's humanity and what goes on. Yeah. Um, but man, I'm I'm I, I'm with you. People who are called to student ministry, like Ryan mm-hmm. and others that we've had on this podcast, they are incredibly equipped, mm-hmm. and insightful, mm-hmm. and I'm thankful that they're out there leading not only, and hear it in his interview, leading the young people, but leading in the other adults who help them lead. Yes. Yes. I want to encourage you, uh, ministry leaders, as we listen to this here in just a moment, he really talks about the partnership between parents and he as a youth pastor. And I think that's something to lean in on and listen to. I also would love for you to listen in to his passion for let's disciple this generation now, not disciple them for the future, disciple them for the present. And I, I just want you to lean in and think about that. And uh, we will we will come back on the other side of the interview and process a little bit more. There are still places around the world where the name of Jesus has never been heard. That's why Operation Christmas Child is sending the gospel through simple shoebox gifts to the ends of the earth. The Greatest Journey follow-up discipleship program is teaching millions of children to put their faith in Christ and how to share that faith with others. Even in the hardest-to-reach places of the world, churches are being planted and communities are being transformed. Your shoebox gifts full of school supplies, toys, and hygiene items will open doors for children around the world to encounter the love of Christ for the very first time as unreached people groups are reached with the good news of Jesus Christ. National Collection Week is November 15th through the 22nd. To learn more about this global evangelism and discipleship movement, or to build a shoebox online, visit SamaritansPurse.org slash OCC. We are joined today by Mr. Ryan Garrett. Ryan is the lead student minister at LifePoint Church in Smyrna, Tennessee. 
With over two decades of his student ministry experience, his passions have not changed. Jesus, his family, and making disciples. His call to student ministry is led by his desire to equip students, minister to families, and build up leaders through the gospel to reach their neighbors and the nations. Ryan, thanks so much for being here today. I'm honored to be here. I'm excited about this conversation. Student ministry is very near and dear to my heart. I was raised in a youth pastor's home. I married one. Uh, (laughs) And so I, I understand this conversation very well well. And with over 20 years of experience, I'm sure it's changed a little bit. Can it's, you talk uh, about how it's changed in the yeah, last 20 years? It's 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 weird because it has changed, but a, some of it hasn't changed. Yeah. Like the the desire for students to come to know the Lord obviously hasn't changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the grades haven't changed, mostly 6th <laughs> through 12th grade, like this very similar. But the the biggest thing that has changed is the the advancement in technology yeah. and the open access that teenagers have to the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, student ministry 15 years ago to, to go uh, to learn anything about what's going on on the other side of the world or much less the other side of the country or the state they live in, they'd have to watch the news, go to school and use the internet at their school. I mean, like all these different things, but they, they have access to everything right. on their phones. And, and uh, that one device... I truly think that one device has changed so much. It's changed the dynamics of our families. It's changed the dyma- da- dynamics of our our thought lives, our, our teenagers' thought lives. Mm-hmm. They look at themselves different. They act different. And it's all because of that that computer in their hand yeah. that they have access to. And I, if there's one thing I could point it to, it's that. Right. And that yeah. has changed. It truly has It's made uh, getting content and stuff to our teenagers a lot easier. Mm-hmm. But it is it has made our jobs as student ministry uh, leaders much harder because we're we're fighting we're fighting against a lot of different areas that yeah. we haven't had to had to deal with over the years. Yeah, well, I'd love to dive into to more of that um, in a little bit, but I'd kind of like to ask. I mean, over twenty years we see a lot of change, but I'm positive in the last two years. You've yeah. seen it change since COVID hit and everything with the pandemic. Can you talk about the last couple of years in student ministry? Yeah, it's been interesting. And it's one of those things where we have we didn't know what was going to happen. Right. I mean, kids were gone. They were disconnected. And we tried to do everything we could. Student ministries across the country were scrambling to try to figure out how to connect. And I think we did the best we could at the time we had in something that we never saw coming. Right. But as we come back, we've seen uh, anxiety and depression, things that that have been in students' lives, but we saw them come out. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, what is the recent statistic that one out of three students are dealing with some type of mental illness or mental uh, struggle yeah. right now? And they're dealing with these things on a regular basis. And we're seeing that come out of isolation. We're seeing that come out of of their focus being on a screen, again, going back to the cell phones, a screen or a laptop or something, not being able to converse and, and have these conversations with their friends. Yeah. I mean, this is this has been huge, and I don't think that we'll see this, the full effect. Yes, we are seeing it now. I think we have years and years to come on this. Yeah. I mean, you think about where our kids are, our, our seniors that graduate this year, the, the seniors that graduate in 2022, their last normal school year was ninth grade. There's a lot that happens between ninth and twelfth grade. There is, it, it's, <laughs> yes. Typically, I mean, you, and you think about our eighth graders. Yeah. Their last normal school year was fifth grade. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, and so, so they don't know what it's really like to to have these experiences in school. So, so they're behind. They're behind scholastically, which they're behind mentally, and they're and they're in this this grown up body. And they're they're not there yet, so it has it has really done some damage to our teenagers, and we're trying to do our best that we can love and serve them, yeah. not just them though, but their families because their families are reeling from this too. Right? How has that changed your mission and vision in your ministry, knowing the effects yeah. like on this side of things drastically? Yeah, I mean we're we're having to look at student ministry totally different than we did yeah. uh, two years ago, three years ago, and and really it's it's the focus of really pouring into families, really pouring into parents, and looking to ways for to truly partner. Like I think I think all churches have the desire to partner with parents, yeah. but truly partner with them, walking alongside them because parents they some some want to be involved and some just don't care. Yeah. 
and trying to and some who just don't care are Christian parents. And I, I don't say that to be ugly. They're just Christian parents who are maybe naive to what the world is 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 throwing at their kids. But we want to come alongside them and, and help prep them and show them like your kids do not need social media. They don't need it. Like there is no redeeming qualities of TikTok. Right. That oh, I yeah. can find. Yeah. I mean, you might could learn how to dance better. Right. Like I, I think that might be it. <laughs> I think there's no like, hope for me. I, I in guess that there's area. zero hope for me. Like, like we'll I, do a TikTok yeah, dance yeah, after like, this. No, Stay tuned. I, 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 no, I, there's nothing. I can't do any of it. But it's like, like there's no redeeming qualities of Snapchat. Right. There's yeah. there's no redeeming qualities. There's barely any redeeming qualities of Instagram. Mm-hmm. It, you know, if I didn't have to have it to send out information or brag on my family, I wouldn't have it. Like, yeah. like it's okay. And the only reason I have Facebook is Facebook Marketplace. Like that's yeah. like <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and so it's like I, I think about our kids that they it's almost like an entitlement that they have to have these things because my friends have them and parents give in because they don't want their kids to be left out. And unfortunately, they they get sucked into that. In our screen times, our kids would have full time jobs on their screens, and they're not getting paid a dime. Yeah, are you seeing any buy in from parents? Oh yeah, yeah. I see. I see. S- not wholesale because it's it's a journey. Right. I wish I could say it, we could go zero to sixty and everything turns around right now. Yeah. No, this is a process. This is this is churches making shifts. This is this is families making shifts. And when it clicks, that's when it's good. Like we see that buy-in of they're going yes, like that. This is what we need to be doing: family discipleship, reading the Bible together, like going through Bible reading plans where we're diving in Scripture together as a family, praying together, worshiping together. That's where the buy-in is. But it's got to click for them. And so, if we can present the resources for them to do such things, and and leave the results of the Holy Spirit, those who really buy in. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Tell us about some of those resources. I, I think a lot of times we say, hey, it's we're, we're looking to mom and dad to be discipling these kids, and let's partner the church with the parents in order to do this, and then we just leave them on their own, like, go and do it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and not resourcing them. So what are yeah. some of those resources well, I mean, that you're D6 giving to them? D6 obviously has plenty of those right. resources, Listen. and you can find those on the website at d6.com. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so you can do that. But there, there's so many ways, and it really, honestly, resourcing them is one thing. Um, and giving them the tools, the books, the sto- the studies, the forums, the the summits, and all that stuff, but truly walking alongside them, like getting in their world, I think is the biggest. Like coming alongside them, okay, okay, assessing their situation, where where what's going on with you? Because each family is different, mm. and so assessing the situation and going, okay, you're dealing with this, okay, let let's see if we can't get you pointed in this direction, yeah, get you connected with these people. Like I've I've probably now, I don't probably, I've sent more students to professional counseling than I in the past two years than I have in 22 years of yeah, ministry. Yeah, same, yeah. And, and I am so thankful that God has gifted people for counseling. Like, because that's, I can get them to a certain point, but after that, God's yeah, gifted. Yeah, past your pay yeah, grade. You've got to understand, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so and I'm so grateful that God has wired people to be able to walk with people in an in-depth, psychological uh, mental depth that I can't get to. Right. And so as we walk with these families, we want to teach them and walk with them. And it's not just like, hey, let me give you the stuff and then walk away. I think that's where we can fall short. Right. Hey, read this article, read this book, and then we'll come back to you with another forum in, in six weeks, 12 weeks. Yeah. No, we got we to gotta walk with them. Let's have lunch together. Let's, let's regularly checking up on folks. And um, yeah, and, and that's... It causes us as student pastors to have to to have to lean into our leaders, our adult volunteers, because we can't do it all our own. And um, so, yeah, it's 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 it is. There are plenty of resources out there, but outside of that, the, the addition too is walking relationally with these folks. Right. Yeah, that's great. This is great uh, content talking about student ministry uh, and family ministry. We're gonna take a quick break, and we will be right back. D6 Curriculum is centered on the discipleship philosophy found in Deuteronomy 6, that parents and grandparents should be primary in the discipleship of their children. To accomplish this, D6 Curriculum aligns every age in church on the same biblical passage or topic. 
Family alignment serves as a catalyst for parents to have conversations with their children about faith in the home. D6 also provides many other tools to help parents and grandparents. Learn how D6 curriculum can empower parents in your ministry at d6family.com. We are talking with Ryan Garrett. Uh, we're talking about student ministry, talking about even uh, coming back after this pandemic and how it's affecting student and family ministry. Uh, we've talked about the, the changes mm. over the last 20 years that you've seen in student yeah. ministry, but then even in the last couple of years, um, again, I was raised by a youth pastor and married one and heard the phrase a lot. When are you going to be like a real pastor? You know, um, yeah, I love that one. If if I it's one if of my I can be honest, and we had this conversation, I had to confess that my husband is now a senior pastor, uh, and there were a lot of people who said congratulations, mm. as if it were, I don't know, like he was getting a better job mm. type of thing, and yeah. I think they meant well. Yeah. You know, like Definitely. that's that's a big sure. deal. That's great, um, but I didn't see it as like. We're stepping up the ladder. It really was a piece that God had given us both uh, in a calling that he had on our lives. We never felt called out of student ministry. We still love students. But I think there's just a misconception that people see student ministry as, oh, that's your stepping right. stone to the next yeah. thing. Can you yeah. talk to, talk about that? I'm sure you've heard that before. I have, and it is, like I said, one of my favorite comments to hear. <laughs> when are you going to be a real pastor? Yeah. Like, I'm a real boy. Like, like, like for me, it's like I, I spend so much time ministering to, to students and families. Like, this is what I do. This is one of my spiritual gifts is shepherding. Like I want to shepherd my flock well and, and through the, the help of the Holy Spirit. And for me, it's, it's, it's not the, like I, as I look five years down the road, I don't, I want kind of like what James says, we can't say we're going to do this and that. We're not going to go in this city and, and go into that city. Like Lord willing, if I get to that, if I get five years down the road, cool. If I could see myself doing other things, for now, and where God has me, I want to uh, bloom where I'm planted, and I want to do what God's called me to do. And right now, it's to pour into teenagers, yeah. and specifically pour into teenagers in Middle Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Um, God hasn't given even for me. I think some youth pastors, younger and around my age, maybe there's some older ones that want to have so much influence. I want to have these this many this many followers on Instagram, and I want to I want to go on a speaking tour, and I want to do this and that, like. I don't even want those things. Like, I'm honored to be sitting here. Like, there are so many people that are so better equipped to be sitting in this chair than me, but that God is, is, has gifted me with this. This is such a mm. gift. Yeah. And to be able to share and maybe encourage someone, like, bloom where you're planted. Don't, don't try to look for the very next thing. Yeah. If God calls you to that, great. That's awesome. Like, pray for the higher things is what Scripture says. Like, pray for those opportunities. But if God doesn't give those to you, man, you, you, you lean in to where He has you now with everything you have. And there are going to be great days, and there are going to be days where you go home and you just want to give up. Yeah. But you can't. Yeah. Because you said it earlier, it's a calling. It's a calling. You didn't pick this. Right. Like, I mean, you think about it. The the pay isn't great. Right. You have to deal <laughs> with so many people's issues. And like, you, you come home and you're like, oh my goodness, I want to go on a date with my wife, but I've got a ball game to go to. And I've got all these things, like, I've you've got all these things going on. Yeah. Like, who would want to really do that, like, on a regular basis? But we're, for a long, for long, a long time. For a long time. <laughs> It's the crazy ones. Yeah. And, and it's the ones with long hair, yes, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I need a haircut. I know. It's, it's, uh, it, I just think about it. It's like, man, we get to have that opportunity because we're called to do yep. it. Yeah. Do you think there's an age that's like too old to be a youth pastor? You we know, got that a lot, I, you know? Yeah. I get that from time to time. I get that from time to time. And you're just aging out. <laughs> you know, when I think about it, um, Tony Hawk. The best, best pro skater ever, ever. He uh, he hits the 900, right? He hit the 900, the biggest trick. He retires from the X Games. Stops me in, like, X Games. He retires for, like, 10, 15 years. This past year, comes back to the X Games, and he's, like, 50, 51 years old. Everybody would say, that dude's too old to be in the X Games. He's Tony Hawk. Right. <laughs> 
he's he's the best skater ever because he knows how to skate. Yeah. In all his experiences and everything that he's done, he's able to to do his craft and do it well. Everything he's learned, all the people that he's been around, he's and able to do. Think how it. it's changed yes. in the and time how he's been around. Yes. It. Yeah. And and for us, it's like okay, in student ministry, all the things I'm a different youth pastor than I, now than I was ten years ago, right. fifteen years ago, mm-hmm. twenty years ago. I'm a different youth pastor. I have a teenager. I have a sixteen year old. Like just having a middle schooler and a high schooler in my house, I'm able to empathize better. Like there are many times where I wanted to call other parents that I've served and just go, I am so sorry for how I gave you that <laughs> advice. Like, wow, I see what you're talking about now. Right, yeah. Like I've learned so much, and I think that that uh, that time has helped so much. So do I think there is an age? Maybe. Maybe there is an age. But I, I don't know when that is. And, and until God calls me or anybody else to do something else, you need to just lean in and, and do what God's called you to do. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've laid the foundation for longevity in ministry, also recognizing the changes that come, uh, even coming off the backside of COVID and ministering to students and families you know that there are bound to be some student pastors who are literally sitting there um, about to give up. You know, they've had a lot of those days where it just feels like, why am I even doing this? If you get just 60 seconds to speak to that student pastor, how can you encourage them right now? It comes from a a spot of fear. And it comes from a spot of, 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 of trust. There's something that's that's causing them to fear. Whether they are on the edge of their job, losing their job, they they uh, there's there's an unmet expectation that they're not hitting that they don't know, or they're just like they can't get a win, or money. They're sitting down across the table with their spouse, and and they're they've got three credit cards that are maxed out because they don't know how to pay their bills because they're paying for school that they spent you know, (laughs) 10 years ago, they're still paying for school. (laughs) Like they're trying to figure it all out. And then it's going, okay, who do I trust here? Because everything, everybody I'm trusting on this earth is like, man, it seems like they're falling flat in in, in my face or they're talking behind my back or whatever. You got to go back to the reason why you're doing this. Again, it goes back to the call. So I would ask them, why were you called? Remember your call. God called you to serve this generation this next generation. This isn't generation next. This is generation now. We're, we're living in this. God has allowed you, gifted you. It's a gift because he could have called anybody else, anybody else to be in the seat that they're in. Yeah. But he called them. And if he wanted to use someone else, he would have used someone else. And so we have to remember, I mean, there's times in scriptures where people got discouraged. And I mean, you think about Elijah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, 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 the prophets of Baal, and everything that's going, like, he sees a cloud the size of a man's hand, and he's like, he's, he's doing all these things. And then he just sits down, and he just wants to die. And God reminds him of his goodness, reminds him in the still, small voice. And what does he do? He goes and finds Elisha. He said, this mission isn't done. He throws his cloak around him, and he takes Elisha with him. And so we can't forget because we've got to press on. We've got to press on. We we can giving up is not an option. And and we just gotta follow his lead. All right. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for sharing with us today. I hope this uh, student pastors and leaders, church leaders that you've leaned in and been encouraged today, uh, at least feel like you're not alone, Mm. you know? Isn't it nice to feel like I'm not the only one who feels this way, Uh, but let's keep pressing on. So thanks for being with us today. I appreciate it. And I'm going to start with uh, what he finished with are close to the end, and, and we can work our way back. It's just because he just dealt with this, he is big on discipleship, which yeah. we tend to think about, let's take God's word and show people what they aspire to. Mm-hmm. But at the end, he says, I want the kiddos, the, the teenagers, to be able to see how he and his wife argue and disagree. Mm-hmm. That's taking the, ne- the perceived negative but how it can be done in a healthy way that that's valuable. I, I, yeah. I wished, I wish my parents had shown me how they argue. Mm-hmm. Uh, my parents divorced when I was 14, mm-hmm. but I never saw them argue. 
And so I didn't really learn how to argue healthy in our marriage. And so my wife and I early in our marriage had to see counseling over how do we deal with disagreements because I didn't have it modeled correctly for me. That yeah. is discipleship. Did, right. let, me, let me ask you, how, how did you see how to deal with the difficulties you know, well, as a teenager? How did you learn those adult things as a teenager that Ryan's talking about? I will tell you, similar to the way he disciples God faithfully in, in the redeeming years, meaning 18 on, yeah. uh, God has strategically placed incredible women in my life. Mm-hmm. And I will never forget this woman who was such a disciple maker in my life at 18. She would head to Walmart and she would call me. It was actually probably between 18 and 20 for me years old, but she would call me and she's like, I'm pulling into Walmart meet me there. And she would disciple me up and down the aisles while she's shopping. And we would talk about everything from sin, confession, repentance, life, college, ethics, all of the things while she's getting her groceries, the woman poured truth and life into me down the aisles of Walmart. And it didn't really cost her. I mean, yes, she's having to be intentional to listen to me and, you know, pour truth into me, but she's shopping. I wonder how many more items she purchased as a result of that. <laughs> I'm sure tons, but, but listen, well, I am I the love woman this I am woman. She day. redeemed her time and poured I, into you. I mean, that is, that is how I was discipled. Life on life, just exactly yeah. what our friend just mentioned about yeah. sharing your life, showing those around you how to fight, how to argue, how to yeah. struggle well. Yeah. You know, you know, as men, we don't tend to find those mentors. Most of us don't early in our life, not at 18. We think we've got it figured out. We're not listening to very many people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you as a youth pastor, children's pastor, whatever, challenge your emerging adults coming out of your teenage years to not let go of those coaches and and call them whatever you want to. Nomenclature is irrelevant. Coaches, mentors, whomever it is, but challenge them to identify three or four and have those Walmart experiences <laughs> wherever God allows you ha- lets you have it. Yes, but, and invite them into your worlds. That's so good. I I loved how Ryan said when he said it out loud. I'm like, where is he going with this? He said, I want to be the number three mm-hmm. in my teens' lives. Mm-hmm. And he was quick, quick to point out he was not there to be the substitute for dad or mom. That's right. I love that because oftentimes student pastors make mom and dad look uncool. Yeah. And I didn't hear that from his heart. No. And if you're a student pastor out here, you Mm -hmm. need to find first partnership with the parents and then with the teens. It yes. should be partnership with the team against the parents in any That's way, right. shape, or form. But That's I right. loved how he did that and says, hey, I'm, I'm just going to show up in your world. I'm going to be your biggest champion. It yes. wasn't about just teaching and training. It was about affirming. No. I, I, you know, I needed somebody like that in my life that was mm-hmm. regular. I had the teachers, mm-hmm. but I didn't have the people who just showed up mm-hmm. and was there in the way that he is describing mm-hmm. in, in that era of my life. I'm raising a 15 year old right now. And I just want to say um, in light of Ryan's podcast, I have a phenomenal youth pastor who comes alongside and there's time Xander and I lock horns about everything. And I mean, everything guys, (laughs) except for maybe food and music. And my youth pastor faithfully, he says it He says the same thing I'm saying, and he mentions this in the podcast where as youth pastors, you need to be speaking the same language as parents. And I want to reiterate what Ron said. Scripture is very clear to honor your father and mother. As adults, we should never be dividing our students against their families, period. That's the... It's scripture's even, clear even about if they're honoring. not believers. That's even right. If they're not in church. You do not right. step into that biological role. That's right. And yeah. he, he reiterates when, when Xander can't hear me, he can hear Stephen. My youth pastor's name is Stephen. He can hear him. He's saying the same thing I'm saying, but because Stephen has got the relational equity, shows up out at track, shows up 
at our dinner table once a week. We have family dinner night. My youth pastor's invited to my, I want him in my house. I want him in our life because here's the thing. Sometimes Xander can't hear me. There's going to be a nice long season where he can't hear me and chat, but he can hear Steven. It's a partnership. And I love that he used that language. Youth pastors, you will have great, great influence in world change. And I mean this from my bones. Yes. You will have great impact on world change if you will fight to work at connecting with your parents, mm-hmm. listening to your parents, ministering to your parents, and championing and supporting your students. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I, if, if you can make the parent who's not in church of that team still feel valued yes, and you thank them for allowing your time with their son or daughter. Thank them for letting the church be a part of their life. And then share with them what you're teaching via text or an email or a note card or whatever. You work to build that relationship with that parent. It's going to make all the difference in the life of that, that teenager you're working with, but also in sharing the gospel with that parent. Be intentional ministering to the parents of, of your kiddos. Um, I, I want to, I want, can I just address too, in light of that, I just had this thought and I wanted to speak to it to the youth pastors out there that are single or young married without children. Let me yeah. just say that uh, I shifted as a ministry leader when I became a parent mm-hmm. because I didn't have to think like that. You know, I didn't have to care for a, a being, <laughs> Yes. But can I just challenge those that don't have children to really lean in and think about what it means to be parental and consider the parent. I think when I wasn't a parent, I dismissed the parent. If I'm being really honest, I was one that would advocate more for the student than I would for the parent. If I'm being really yes. honest yes. and that wasn't wise on my part. I, I was driving really a wedge between parents and my ministry because I wanted to be the hero. And that's just me being vulnerable about my insecurity. But at the end of the day, now that I'm a parent, it shifts everything. These, these parents are entrusting their children into your care. And it's not so much about you being the hero as much as it's about if we're going to honor Deuteronomy 6, it's about the parent being the hero and Jesus being the hero. And so if we could shift into thinking that way, oh, man, you will get great return in your ministry if you'll think that way. You will indeed. And and I'll go a step further. Um, I was working with a decision, working with a person who was wrestling with a decision that his church made in their Mm -hmm. student ministry. Mm-hmm. And the student pastor is young, married, no kids. I mean, we're talking newly married, mm-hmm. just out of you know college. And the, the wisdom that my friend gave to this student pastor was brilliant. He said, right now you can't, as you just said, Marianne, think like a parent. He said, you need to identify five, six, depending on the size of your youth group. You know, if you get a smaller group, maybe it's two or three. But if you got a decent sized group, youth group, identify five or six couples or parents mm-hmm. inside your youth ministry that are somewhat spiritually mature and parents of different age kids, maybe 17 year olds, maybe 13 year olds. Mm-hmm. And when you're thinking about the strategy and you're thinking about programming and you're thinking about some of the activities, touch base with them, bounce some ideas off of them, get their feedback before you make a big announcement or send a big email, you've got to roll back and retract. Yeah. How many times have we seen that happen? Because it wasn't thought through from exactly what you identified, that parental mindset. Mm-hmm. Like, uh-oh, what was I thinking? <laughs> I thought it was a great idea at the moment. Then I hit send and all of a sudden all these replies came back. You know, we I think you and I have both seen that happen in, in, in our areas. Absolutely. So, I'm thankful for, for Ryan's approach. I'm thankful. He's at a tremendously healthy church. Uh, he's been there a while. He is, he's doing some amazing work. He's been a speaker at the conference, um, for us at D six, which reminds me, once you identify those key leaders in your, those parental leaders in your church, have them read a book with you, whatever you're thinking, read together, plan together, 
take them to conferences with you. Do what do what it takes to develop them while you are developing yourself, and you will multiply your ministry efforts many times over. That's right. Well, thank you, Ryan, for that insight. We're going to pray for student ministry and parents of student ministry that are out there looking for those ways to step into their lives. And maybe you're out there and your, your teenagers are grown. I would challenge you to volunteer your time back down at student ministry. Yeah. It doesn't have to be every week, but you can just lean in and say, hey, when you're doing some activity or whatever, I want to be there. I want to go on your field trip or I want to drive a van or whatever it is. Just offer your time to be present. Yes. It might not even be doing something. It That's will right. be incredibly helpful. Well, mm-hmm. next week we have uh, a guest. And you remember who our guest is, Miss Marianne? Yes, Rachel Nimeroff. She is an artist and um, has some really amazing testimony of collaborating while she writes and what it looks like to be an artist on the road. So I'm looking forward to this interview is really fun. I will tell you that um, David asked some really fun questions to get to know the artist. And so Ron and I are going to tackle some of those questions too. So we look forward to our interview next week and we're praying for you and we will see you next week. You've been listening to the D6 Podcast. You can learn more about D6 at d6family.com.